Good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President and I are very pleased to welcome you to our press conference. We will now report on the outcome of today's meeting of the Governing Council, which was also attended by the Commission Vice President, Mr. Dombrovskis. Based on our regular economic and monetary analysis, we have conducted a thorough assessment of the economic and inflation outlook also taking into account the latest staff macroeconomic projections for the euro area. As a result, the Governing Council took the following decisions in the pursuit of its price stability objective. First, we decided to keep the key ECB interest rates unchanged. We now expect them to remain at their present levels at least through the end of 2019, and in any case, for as long as necessary to ensure the continued sustained convergence of inflation to levels that are below but close to 2% over the medium term. Second, we intend to continue reinvesting in full the principal payments from maturing securities purchased under the asset purchase program for an extended period of time past the date when we start raising the key ECB interest rates, and in any case for as long as necessary to maintain favorable liquidity conditions and an ample degree of monetary accommodation. Third, we decided to launch a new series of quarterly targeted longer-term refinancing operations, TELTRO 3, starting in September this year and ending in March 2021, each with a maturity of two years. These new operations will help to preserve favorable bank lending conditions and the smooth transmission of monetary policy. Under TELTRO 3, counterparties will be entitled to borrow up to 30% of the stock of eligible loans as at 28 February 2019 at a rate indexed to the interest rate on the main refinancing operations over the life of each operation. Like the outstanding TELTRO program, TELTRO 3 will feature built-in incentives for credit conditions to remain favorable. The further details on the precise terms of TELTRO 3 will be communicated in due course. Fourth, we will continue conducting our lending operations as fixed rate tender procedures with full allotment for as long as necessary and at least until the end of the, of the reserve maintenance period, starting in March 2021. Today, monetary policy decisions were taken, I'm sorry, <coughs> were taken to ensure that inflation remains on a sustained path towards levels that are below but close to 2% over the medium term. While there are signs that some of the idiosyncratic domestic factors dampening growth are starting to fade, the weakening in economic data points to a sizable moderation in the pace of the economic expansion that will extend into the current year. The persistence of uncertainties related to geopolitical factors, the threat of protectionism, and vulnerabilities in emerging markets appears to be leaving marks on economic sentiment. Moreover, underlying inflation continues to be muted. The weaker economic momentum is slowing the adjustment of inflation towards our aim. At the same time, supportive financing conditions, favorable labor market dynamics, 
and rise in wage growth continue to underpin the euro area expansion and gradually rise in inflation pressures. Today's decisions will support the further build up of domestic price pressures and headline inflation developments over the medium term. Significant monetary policy stimulus will continue to be provided by our foreign guidance on the key ECB interest rates, reinforced by the reinvestments of the sizable stock of acquired assets and the new series of Teltros. In any event, the Governing Council stands ready to adjust all of its instruments as appropriate to ensure that inflation continues to move towards the Governing Council's inflation aim in a sustained manner. Let me now explain our assessment in greater detail, starting with the economic analysis. Euro area real GDP increased by 0.2% quarter on quarter in the fourth quarter of 2018, following growth of 0.1 in the third quarter. Incoming data have continued to be weak, in particular in the manufacturing sector, reflecting the slowdown in external demand compounded by some country and sector specific factors. The impact of these factors is turning out to be somewhat longer lasting, which suggests that the near term growth outlook will be weaker than previously anticipated. Looking ahead, the effect of these adverse factors is expected to unwind. The euro area expansion will continue to be supported by favorable financing conditions, further employment gains and rising wages, and the ongoing, albeit somewhat slower, expansion in global activity. This assessment is broadly reflected in the March 2019 ECB staff macroeconomic projections for the euro area. These projections foresee annual rate GDP increasing by 1.1% in 2019, 1.6% in 2020, 1.5% in 2021. Compared with the December 2018 Eurosystem staff macroeconomic projections, the outlook for real GDP growth has been revised down substantially in 2019 and slightly in 2020. The risks surrounding the euro area growth outlook are still tilted to the downside on account of <coughs> excuse me on account of the persistence of uncertainties related to geopolitical factors, the threat of protectionism, and vulnerabilities in the emerging markets. According to Eurostat's flash estimate, Euro area annual HICP inflation was 1.5 cent in February 2019, after 1.4 in January, reflecting somewhat higher energy and food price inflation. On the basis of, futures, of current futures prices for oil, headline inflation is likely to remain at around the current levels before declining towards the end of the year. Measures of underlying inflation remain generally muted, but labor cost pressures have strengthened and broadened amid high levels of capacity utilization and tightening labor markets. Looking ahead, underlying inflation is expected to increase over the medium term, supported by our monetary policy measures, the ongoing economic expansion, and rising wage growth. <coughs> this assessment is also broadly reflected in the March 2019 ECB staff macroeconomic projections for the euro area which foresee annual HICP inflation at 1.2% in 2019, 1.5% in 2020, and 1.6% in 2021. Compared with the December 
2018 Eurosystem staff macroeconomic projections, the outlook for HICP inflation has been revised down across the projection horizon, reflecting in particular the more subdued near-term growth outlook. Turning to the monetary analysis, broad money M3 growth decreased to 3.8% in January 2019 from 4.1% in December 2018. M3 growth continues to be backed by bank credit creation, notwithstanding a recent moderation in credit dynamics. The narrow monetary aggregate M1 remained the main contributor to broad money growth. The annual growth rate of loans to non-financial corporations declined to 3.3% in January from 3.9% in December last year, reflecting a base effect, but also in some countries, the typical lagged reaction to the slowdown in economic activity while the annual growth rate of loans to households remained at 3.2%. Borrowing conditions for firms and households are still favorable. As the monetary policy measures put in place since June 2014 continue to support access to financing, in particular for small and medium-sized enterprises. The policy measures decided today and in particular, the new series of Teltros will help to ensure that bank lending conditions remain favorable going forward. To sum up, a cross-check of the outcome of economic analysis with the signals coming from the monetary analysis confirmed that an ample degree of monetary accommodation is still necessary for the continued sustained convergence of inflation two levels that are below but close to 2% over the medium term. In order to reap the full benefits from our monetary policy measures, other policy areas must contribute more decisively to raising the longer term growth potential and reducing vulnerabilities. The implementation of structural reforms in Euro area countries needs to be substantially stepped up to increase resilience, reduce structural unemployment, and boost euro area productivity and growth potential. This is particularly important in view of the overall limited implementation of the 2018 country-specific recommendations as recently communicated by the European Commission. Regarding fiscal policies, the mildly expansionary euro area fiscal stance and the operation of automatic stabilizers are providing support to economic activity. At the same time, countries where government debt is high need to continue rebuilding fiscal buffers. All countries should continue to increase efforts to achieve a more growth-friendly composition of public finances. Likewise, the transparent and consistent implementation of the European Union's fiscal and economic governance framework over time and across countries remains essential to bolster the resilience of the euro area economy. Improving the functioning of economic and monetary union remains a priority. The Governing Council welcomes the ongoing work and urges further specific and decisive steps to complete the Banking Union and the Capital Markets Union. And we are now at your disposal for questions. Ms. Locke. <coughs> Carolyn Locke, Bloomberg. Mr. President, um, could you give us an idea about uh, the reasons why you decided on the specific features of the TELTO 3 program? So, for example, why are the maturities two years? Why have you indexed it to the MRO? And also, why is the start date in September when uh, the funding becomes relevant for banks' net stable funding ratios in June already. And um, my second question is what you would like to achieve with this program. So are you trying to keep the size of the balance sheet stable or are you trying to add extra accommodation? Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, the design of the Teltro responds to a variety of objectives, but the key one is a look. Uh, the key the key objective derives from uh, uh, how the situation of uh, bank funding looks like over the next few years. Uh, in the coming years, we will have a congestion uh, for bank funding caused by obviously some uh, the the coming to maturity of the existing teltros the um, coming to maturity of a sizable amount of bank bonds uh, various regulatory compliances and uh, so the teltros as as it's been said in the introductory statement maintain favorable preserve favorable bank lending conditions and the smooth transmission of monetary policy. Now, the precise desi design, whether it's two instead of four, do reflect the, the changed conditions we have today. Now, further, further details, uh, especially on the pricing and other details, will come to, will, will get to be known in due time. Now, on, uh, on the um, second question really addresses the uh, substance of today's meeting. So let me give you a kind of a broad account of how this meeting, uh, how this meeting uh, unfolded, and in so doing, I think I'm pretty sure I respond to some of the questions you, you, you uh, intend to ask. Um, so first of all, the decisions. It's four sets of decisions. Uh, we uh, expect, so we moved the uh, calendar-based part of our forward guidance from September to December. Uh, the second, we confirm the reinvestment in full of the principal payments from maturing securities. Now, you understand now the importance of the chain, uh, of the chain element in our monetary policy. Uh, having moved the calendar based, so does the uh, expected, or well, whatever the horizon is gonna be over the, per during which the purchases will the the, the purchase will take place to uh, to keep the uh, to keep the stock unchanged. So you see this added accommodation. So to answer your question, as a matter of fact, you asked me whether this is adding accommodation. The financing conditions uh, have uh, have been well. Monetary policy has been very accommodative, but also financing conditions, as a matter of fact, have even eased since our last meeting. And this is also partly due to the uh, structure of our uh, forward guidance so that uh, expected interest rates uh, have gone down since the last meeting, and especially at the end, at the end of last year as well. So then we have the third, the third element is the um, targeted longer-term refinancing operations that we've just discussed. And then we have the uh, fixed rate tender procedures with full allotment as for as long as necessary, at, at least until the end of the reserve maintenance period starting in March 2021. Now, what are the features of all, of all, uh, of all these measures? First of all, they are data-driven. Uh, uh, these are decisions that have been taken uh, following a significant downward revision of the forecast by our staff. Second, you see, you've seen and you just heard me saying that optionality is, uh, is reiterated in all instances, which means that the Governing Council is uh, both uh, willing and uh, committed to act uh, when, if needed, uh, amplifying the use of these instruments based on the data. And third is what I just said, is that all this takes place in an environment where monetary policy accommodation is already, already uh, very uh, substantial. Second point is how did we get to take these decisions? And uh, uh, the answer here is that they were unanimous. It was unanimity. And uh, I think in the, given the complexity of the package, I think this is a very, very positive sign for the cohesiveness of uh, uh, the Governing Council and uh, of our deliberations. Third, what is the general context in which these decisions uh, have taken place? Well, we're coming 
maybe we still are, in a period of continued weakness and, uh, we, and, uh, and uh, pervasive uncertainty. And that's why the forecast uh, have, has been revised uh, downward uh, quite significantly. Now, the, I will come and comment in a moment about the pervasive uncertainty, but the factors that, are caused, that have originally caused this, uh, uh, this weakness, which are mostly of external source, are still there. And so the uncertainty is partly related to how, how long these factors will continue affecting uh, the world economy, the Eurozone economy, and confidence more generally. And there are two uh, observations to make about the assessment of the outlook. First, uh, the Governing Council expressed confidence. All members expressed confidence in the baseline, which means that uh, we assess the probabilities of a recession as being very low, as well as the probabilities of a de-anchoring of inflation expectations uh, we are, are indeed very low in our assessment. What are the reasons? Well, the reasons are the same that underpin the strength of our economy in our previous meetings, namely nominal wage growth continues to uh, continues the labor market, uh, though at a kind of lower rate, but continues to improve. Consumption <laughs> remains by and large in, uh, in good shape. Monetary policy remains accommodative and now is even more accommodative. And financing conditions, as I said, have eased up. If they were already very easy and they eased up further. And there is a second factor that we've taken into account in uh, <clears throat> maintaining this confidence is that it's true that these external factors continue to be uh, hanging on continue to be waning on, uh, on the Eurozone economy. But it's also true that uh, governments are responding in their respective jurisdictions with policies that are addressing these problems in US, in China. The second, uh, the second point to be kept in mind is that you've seen that the revision uh, of the inflation path uh, will uh, basically says one thing. We have confidence that will converge, but we also, at this point in time, uh, think that it will, it's going to take longer to get there. So, and why, why is it going to take longer? Well, the weaker growth uh, probably will uh, further slow down the pass through from higher nominal wages to higher price, higher inflation, and, uh, and possibly also slow down the closure of the, uh, will, will also slow down the, the, the output gap. In other words, the output gap now is uh, closing. So these two reasons are important to, to, be, to be kept in mind. Now, the other important part of today's decision is that we maintained the risk assessment as tilted to the downside. This isn't frequent because we usually say when we take some policy actions, the risks get back into balance. But it's happened on other occasions in the past, but not frequently. And why is that? Well, because we are aware that our decisions certainly increase the resilience of this Eurozone economy, but can actually they, can they address these factors that are weighing on the Eurozone economy in the rest of the world? They cannot. So the threat of protectionism is one factor. Geopolitical considerations also related to, the, to whatever happens about the United Kingdom uh, uh, Brexit or United Kingdom exiting or not exiting or in the, the, fo the forms in which they will exit from, from the European Union. Um, so the emerging market vulnerabilities, what's happening in China. We know that ch the Chinese government has reacted, the US government has, the US, I mean, the monetary policy has changed. But for example, in US, we have to take into account that there is going to be 
a waning effect of the fiscal package. So a slowdown is projected there all over. So basically our actions increase the resilience of the Eurozone economy. And, um, and so make us confident, keep us confident that uh, convergence to a sustainable rate of inflation, uh, our objective will happen. Thank you. Ms. Weisbach. Annette Weisbach, CNBC. Um, can I ask you about what you said uh, a little bit earlier, that you're standing ready to adjust all of your instruments available. Does that also include the net asset purchase program? Could you revive it in case the economy is not going any way better and the inflation outlook is going to worsen? And then I have an, uh, an, a question on the underlying assumption of your growth and inflation estimates, is the underlying assumption that US and China will come to an agreement on trade or not? Thank you. <coughs> the, the answer to the second question is that our projections take into account the uh, protectionist measures that have already been implemented, but they don't uh, uh, project an assessment of future measures. So or of how the current negotiation will, will, will actually end. Um, on, the, on, the, on the first, on the, uh, your first question is, um, well, you've seen optionality is everywhere. Now, the issue is whether we see contingencies that would justify the use of certain instruments or instead of others. And I don't want to speculate at this point in time. At this point in time, we've just taken all these decisions and we think they are uh, the right decisions and the adequate um, decisions to be, take, to be taken at this point in time. But let me add one thing. We didn't tighten when we stopped purchasing the net asset, uh, we, when we stopped the net asset purchase program. We didn't tighten monetary policy, contrary to some, to what some, what, uh, what uh, some of you say. Well, not, I'm not sure, even sure it's one of you, but I mean, just, it's, it's been said. Um, we didn't tighten at all. Uh, we, um, we continue, uh, just to give you an idea, the, 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 the balance sheet is, uh, of the ECB is about 42, 43% of the Eurozone GDP. Uh, the Fed is about half of it now. And in order to keep this stock unchanged, we continue purchasing something the order of 20 billion euro a month of bonds, and this happens in a context where the debt to GDP ratio in the Eurozone is actually falling. So uh, the, the simple action of maintaining a stock unchanged in this context actually is a continuous easing because interest rates are, 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 are pushed downward. By this, uh, by this action. So, and you can see this because since we decided June last year, interest rates have gone down, they keep on going down, term premium is negative, so conditions uh, are very, very accommodative. And if you add to this what I just said, it's the, the chained element of this, of the, of the horizon over which will carry out purchases to keep the stock unchanged moves together with the forward guidance. But to finish the answer, it, what today's decisions also say uh, is that uh, we've taken, we changed the calendar based part of our forward guidance based on the information we have today. And it's data driven. In this sense, we are, we are very open to act and determined to act when it's needed. Ms. Jones. Claire Jones, Financial Times. Um, ahead of the meeting, there was some talk from some of the members of the Governing Council about whether or not to introduce a tiered system, whether to start by raising the, um, the deposit rate. So I'm just wondering, was there any trade-off in terms of extending the guidance to the end of this year rather than, say, further into 2020? in order to not have to make any commitment to move to some sort of tiered system and in order to have the <laughs> unanimity behind the decisions that you've had today. Um, and having said that, even though the guidance 
on rates isn't as extended as far as markets are now foreseeing for the first rate rise. There is a broad sense in which you've got ahead of the curve today and that you have really surprised people by not only announcing something on Teltros, but also announcing that you've shifted your message on forward guidance. So can you maybe explain a little bit about the reaction function here, why you've decided to deploy these shock and awe tactics? Was there something in particular that has scared you that you've seen in this, in the recent data? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Several uh, members of the Governing Council um, presented the option of m changing the calendar, the calendar date uh, of the forward guidance to March next year. Um, in a way, that was an option. It was, uh, and the other members uh, discussed uh, uh, the what the consequence of a protracted period of time with negative rates, so low, lower or low for longer, could uh, imply for banks. Uh, but there was no trade-off between the two. There was no trade-off. And in the end, um, we converged on a package that basically reflected the views of, uh, of all the members of the Governing Council. Um, and I think that's, that's what I, uh, now the second part of your question is whether, well, we, uh, markets have pretty well understood our reaction function. And uh, so in placing the, uh, the expected date of the lift, in the DFR sometime in 2019, <coughs> before it was later, now it's moved back. And, um, and so the changing calendar in the calendar part uh, uh, in the date of our forward guidance becomes necessary when you kind of want to give credibility because clearly if you have expectations, market expectations, which are far away from the foreseen date of, uh, of, uh, of the guidance, then of course credibility becomes an issue. In this sense, I. I think we've, uh, if anything, enhanced the credibility of the forward guidance with today's decision. Okay. Mr. Corani. <coughs> Thank you, Palash Corani from Reuters. In your statement, you said there will be some incentives built into the tel shows. I'd like to find out a bit more about this. What kind of incentives? And is the MRO the, the lowest rate banks could pay, or do the incentives take it lower, possibly? Um, the second question is about the, the supervisory board, and um, I'm, I'm curious why you left three positions vacant, a fourth one is going to be vacant very soon, uh, why are you not uh, picking people to the supervisory board? W what's the benefit of depleting the supervisory board? Thank you. Uh, the, uh, the first question is, is really, I can't say more than I said in the introductory statement. The price in the shape and other details on the Teltro will be will be made known in due time. So it's um, uh, so the what what I just said about uh, whatever incentives and uh, language you just quoted. Uh, it's the intention of designing in a way <laughs> that um, built that gives built-in incentives for credit conditions to remain favorable but doesn't uh, get further into being more specific at this point in time. Um, on, the, on the supervisory board, uh, yes, I, well, it, it is a process which will be carried out in a completely transparent way in the coming weeks. And uh, it's uh, with a change in the chair and so on, so everything's been delayed, but will take time soon. It'll take place soon. Mr. Mali? Jan Malin, Handelsblatt. Um, I have one question on the timing. Um, yeah, markets were quite surprised about your decisions today. Um, why did you decide to act now? Because many people have argued before the meeting that there's such a high uncertainty and that it would be maybe better to, to wait to see how this if this uncertainty is materialized or not. 
And my second question um, is on your forward guidance. You, you kept the state contingent part and the time contingent part. Um, why have you kept the time contingent part? Because you also said um, it could be pushed further uh, ahead and um, would it not give you more flexibility to, 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 to just have the state contingent part? Thank you. Thank you. The, the presence of, well, <laughs> the two things were present pervasive uncertainty, but also a, a, a definite worsening in uh, the projections. Uh, so the fact that uh, the climate has become more uncertain doesn't mean that one has to stay put. Uh, the, so you, you just do what you think is right. You temper, however, what you're doing with the consideration there is uncertainty. So in other words, in a, in a dark room, you move with tiny steps. You don't run, but you do move. Or say in other words, uh, you try to be proactive rather than reactive to contingencies because for a variety of reasons, the situation can then unfold in, a, in an unforeseen and unwanted way. So that's the, that's the answer to, to the first question. The second question, the two, uh, the two, the, the R4 guys have been designed with two legs, the state and the time, and the, both of them reinforce each other. B and both of them give credibility to each other. To have a state uh, uh, only is kind of, as you said, perhaps gives more flexibility, but at the same time, being vaguer is less effective. Thank you. Mr. Stumpf. Hi, Andres Stumpf from Expansion. Uh, could you elaborate a bit more uh, in, in, the cho in the chosen of the TLTRO with T instead of an LTRO? Uh, what have been the, the reasons for this? And uh, just one question more. Uh, do you want to make any comment on the, on the statement of the ECB that has confirmed that you are going to end your mandate without hiking the interest rates? <laughs> well, no, I make no comments. <laughs> it's, not, it's not, first of all, it's not me, it's the governing council. But I have no comments to make. Now, the, the other point is actually, uh, it's been discussed. What uh, uh, the, the, the first ELTROs were quite effective for the time uh, when they had been designed. But they uh, were used, uh, not 100%, not of course, but they were used uh, also to uh, kind of buy sovereign bonds. Uh, at that time, the yields on bonds were high, and banks, uh, in, especially in parts of the Eurozone, were to lend to the economy was uh, very risky because these parts were in huge recession, they uh, bought sovereign bonds. What uh, then we wanted to achieve with the T was to make sure, to minimize this possibility, to make sure the banks borrow at a very good rate, but in order to lend to the economy and to firms and households and the private sector not to buy sovereign bonds. Ms. Bufaki? Isabella Bufaki from uh, Sole 24 Ore. I have two questions, uh, Mr. President. One is on uh, markets that um, have been surprised, and actually we, I think, have also been surprised by these uh, moves, uh, for uh, bold moves on uh, an accommodation that was already very ample. Uh, mm, is your message not only to the markets but also to European governments? Um, is Europe, do you view, reacting as you are reacting uh, in a bold matter to the deterioration of, uh, of the economy? And um, I know there is a lot on the plate, so I don't want to go too far on the toolbox of others, but I've seen that uh, Philip Lane now is confirmed as new executive bond member, and uh, he's also linked to a project of safe 
assets. And uh, do you feel that the, um, the ECB has enough uh, in its toolbox? Do you feel that Europe uh, and, uh, on, has enough in its toolbox as well? Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, the, um, I think, well, well, let me first respond to the first part. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's easy for us to uh, plea for more action at European level in all directions, institutional policies and so on. Uh, I think we should do it, but we should be aware that uh, these are uh, political decisions that uh, governments uh, can take or have to take, or, uh, but they have to uh, explain to their citizens. Uh, it's relatively easy to, to advise uh, about the right policy. Uh, much more difficult it is to implement it in a democratic uh, society, of course. So the, I think, uh, certainly I've said many times, the European construction is still fragile. Uh, the completion of the monetary union is essential. The completion of the banking union is essential. Capital market union are all essential things. And by the way, some of these things are very, very close to be, to be implemented because much of this has been agreed and the remaining differences don't seem to be of an order of magnitude that could stop the whole process. So it, when, when the, uh, I would say, when the political contingencies, when the political stars will align, I'm absolutely confident that we'll see fast progress on all these fronts. Now, Philip Lane is an excellent acquisition for the ECB, but we are not going to ask him about the safe, uh, the, the, this, uh, this Eurobond thing. Uh, the Eurobond is, um, again, it's not, it's not something that the ECB can, uh, uh, can, uh, can force or just decide about. Again, it's an inherently political decision. And of course, uh, this doesn't uh, detract at all from the argument that it's absolutely rational to have a safe asset at European level. It's fundamental. Uh, but one thing is to say it's fundamental. Another thing is to decide and, and uh, defend this decision in front of your citizens, which may have different views about that from the ECB. Mr. Michael Rasch, Neue Zürcher Zeitung. Two questions, if I may. Uh, the Teltros are also a kind of uh, subsidies for banks, especially for weak banks. A lot of these banks are paying dividends to their shareholders and bonuses to their senior managers. Do you think uh, this fits together with the subsidies? And my second question, some economists are thinking the ECB policy was behind the curve in the last quarters. Uh, meaning monetary policy was not fully in line with the economic cycle. Do you understand these critics, or do you think the critic is unfair? Uh, well, on <clears throat> your first question, a Teltro is an operation which uh, gives, uh, uh, which allows banks to borrow money from the ECB at uh, somewhat more favorable terms than the banks could do going to the market, and that's the essence. And uh, so the issue is not whether there is a subsidy or not. There is a subsidy. Now, it depends very much on how it's designed, of course. If there were no subsidies, then the, nobody would take up the Teltros. Um, so the issue is whether the uh, Teltro fulfills monetary policy objectives and helps the transmission of monetary policy. And, uh, and we believe it's always done that. It's been very effective, as a matter of fact, in reactivating the banking sector in the Eurozone and in uh, transmitting, especially the Teltro, transmitting the better con lending conditions to firms and households, to the private sector in the economy. I think that's the, that's the yardstick of successful Teltro. And uh, certainly, I have all reasons to think that this will be designed exactly in the same 
with the same, uh, with the same uh, effectiveness. Um, your other question was? Oh, oh, behind. Uh, n well, we never thought we were behind the curve. I think uh, we've been. Uh, and, and there, is, there are. Well, in any event, today we are not behind the curve for sure. But but this uh, even before, because the the way the um, monetary policy had been designed, the monetary policy has been designed after June, would produce automatic accommodation that would uh, make. Uh, financing conditions easier as far as the monetary policy component is concerned. Uh, then, of course, when, uh, since we I said, and it was like that before too, I mean, just uh, since um, um, we are in our deliberations data-driven, when it's become necessary to add to this automatic process, we did it. Mr. Fellas? <laughs> Thanks. Um, Ms. Draghi, I had the, my first question was on QE and whether, was there any discussion this week about restarting the program? Um, you know, would that be the next tool, the, the, the next stimulus tool you could use in the event of a downturn around uh, no-deal Brexit, for instance? Um, and the second question is, given the length of the Eurozone recovery so far, is there a risk that the economy is becoming too dependent on ECB stimulus? Thanks. <clears throat> well, the answer is no to both questions, actually. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, there was no discussion about QE, uh, not at all. And uh, uh, there was no, <laughs> uh, th there's no lack of recovery in the Eurozone economy. Uh, we, we <laughs> I have dwelt long enough on the worsening of the economic outlook but we're all still talking about weaker growth. So we're talking about expansion. The economy continues to expand. The labor market continues to add jobs. Weight, nominal wages continue to grow, as a matter of fact, at a higher rate than they used to a year ago or two years ago. Even interesting, the dispersion amongst growth rates of nominal wages across sectors and countries is now at a historical minimum meaning that it's gradually, yes. So the point is that we've got to be patient in terms of pass through. Uh, it, uh, we, see, <clears throat> we see nominal wages going up and we don't see prices going up at the same time. And we have to be patient because, the, because first of all, now we are having a slowdown, but also because the mechanism whereby increasing the cost wages and, and also, I mean, other parts of the cost components of, are transferred into prices has changed structurally in the last few years. And you've seen this in the United States and you're seeing this in Europe now. Mr. Hyten. Uh, Luke Hyten, Market News. Mr. Draghi, given that the 2021 inflation forecast is already only 1.6%, if any external shocks were to materialize, can you envisage a situation in which the deposit rate could be uh, lowered even further? And was there any discussion of this at today's meeting? And my second question was, um, it's been argued that high current account surpluses have a detrimental effect on inflation across the Eurozone. Might one answer to disappointing inflation rates be to adopt a tougher stance towards those countries whose surpluses exceed, to adopt, sorry, might one answer to disappointing inflation rates be to adopt a tougher stance towards those countries whose surpluses exceed 6% of GDP? Thank you. Um, first question, no, there was no discussion. Uh, the second question is, it's, <coughs> you find a hint in the introductory statement about um, how uh, a proper fiscal policy could actually help not only the recovery, not only the convergence of inflation to our path, objective path, but also on the issue of uh, external surplus. When you read the uh, last section of our introductory statement, which says, uh, which says um, um, <clears throat> well, it says basically 
the implementation of the country-specific recommendations as recently communicated by the European Commission has been scant or not much at, at, at best. And then it says uh, this is it's a change with respect to previous IES. Regarding fiscal policies, the mildly expansion of euro area fiscal stance and the operational automatic stabilizers are providing support to economic activity. And then it goes into the same usual statement for countries with high debt. So you see that uh, there, is a, there is a clear recognition that, uh, of, of what you said. But again, uh, to this, I, uh, I would apply the same degree of humility that I would apply to the, to the, to the in answering to the question about Europe and whether Europe is responding or not, uh, are political decisions. We, and uh, even though we may be convinced that it's right, we also be, have to be aware that, uh, that uh, we are not the ones who implement these decisions. Mr. Schroes. <laughs> Thank you, Mark Schroes, Börsen Zeitung. My first question um, is on the, uh, also on the deficit facility rate. You mentioned that there was a discussion about the potential risk to banks if, uh, uh, following this slow for longer uh, interest rate policy. I'm not sure, have you al also discussed ways to mitigate the adverse effects or discussed when there might be a uh, point in time when you have to decide on, on such things? Um, and the second question, you, you mentioned several times optionality is everywhere and that the toolbox is rich. Um, is also helicopter money part of the toolbox, especially given the fact that you've called it once an interesting concept? Thank you. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Well, that was a concession to my past academic experience, but uh, no, the answer is no to both questions. And um, the, the effect that negative rates might have on banks' balance sheets is complex and uh, was not um, the specific mitigating, uh, mitigating measures were not discussed. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we dis I mean, there was a discussion about the, the need to examine this issue in, in depth. Because, you know, I mean, negative rates have been quite successful in, uh, in our monetary policy. They produced, uh, they, they were an instrument, powerful instrument in enhancing, fostering the recovery um, and, uh, and, uh, and converging to price stability and uh, achieving our objective. Um, so when uh, there are several analyses trying to assess what's the effect of negative rates for some time on banks' profitability, but they're very, very complicated. First of all, we're talking about aggregates. Now, the way in which a negative rate affects the uh, bank's profitability depends very much on what business model the bank has. And so you have situations where this influence is very, very important and significant and situations where it's not. And if you combine in the aggregate, you don't see much, in spite of the many years that passed by. Um, so it's been successful. Second point, <clears throat> one may argue that, uh, that certainly uh, at the beginning, combined with the QE, there were benefits coming from the recovery, coming from the selling of the bonds with the QE, and there were costs coming from the negative rates. Now, how all this has evolved through time is, uh, is quite, uh, quite complicated. Also, again, talking about the aggregate, but that's why I'm not satisfied with looking at aggregates so much, but uh, that's what we have to do. Uh, you see that uh, when you talk about profitability of European banks, well, it's certainly lower than profitability of American banks but not much lower than UK or uh, Japan, uh, whether they have mitigating measures or not. And uh, so, because there are many elements that affect the profitability. Uh, so we have to look at this issue in uh, somewhat greater detail uh, and not necessarily related to the negative rates, but more generally, what are the components of banks' profitability that are being affected by our monetary policy, and one of which is the negative rate. Mr. Barbera. 
Zagi, my question is, uh, how much of the 2019 uh, GDP slowdown is due by the Italian economic situation and why? Thank you. I, um, thank you, because I had, didn't comment exactly on the factors for the slowdown of 2019. Um, there are two sets of factors, external and internal to the Eurozone. The external factors are, I hinted at them before, it's a slowdown, mostly slowdown in world trade uh, due to a slowdown in China, uh, various emerging market vulnerabilities, a potential slowdown in the United States, and, um, and I think a general uh, sort of um, uh, lower confidence produced by the uh, trade uh, trade uh, discussions, let's call them this way. Uh, and this certainly, uh, this sort of diminished confidence filtered through countries and sectors, and it's one major factor for the slowdown in the Eurozone economy. Then we have internal factors. Some of them are sector specific and country specific, namely car industry in Germany. But there are also other, other sectors and other countries, one of which is certainly Italy. So it's, uh, it's uh, and the, and the, so we know what has produced the slowdown. Where the uncertainty comes into play is how long these factors will be, will be uh, sort of hovering, will be weighing on the, on the Eurozone economy. That's the end. And the final question to Ms. Laird, please. Thank you. Uh, two questions, if, if I may, Mr. Draghi. The first is a follow-on question to the gentleman to my left. Are there any other regions or industries that you think are particularly vulnerable that you may be keeping an eye on? The second question is, do you have any concern that equity markets are a little bit more concerned about a recession than you may be? And, and I say that because I'm looking at the equities that are doing well. They're very defensive stocks, cyclical stocks. So. Do you have any concerns that the markets are more bearish than you may be? Well, I, I'm not sure uh, that equity markets are more bearish because they actually regained everything they lost in the last part of the year, last year. They, they gained it back and, and plus. So, um, but we have to see what are the sources of these uh, increasing stock prices. In some parts of the world, this is caused mostly by earnings expectations that are good. In other parts of the world, this is caused by a decreasing risk premium. And earning expectations actually appear to have less of an influence in explaining price increases. So I think that says something about uh, the expectations about the economy, the future evolution of the economy. Mind, there is another factor which has played quite a quite Im important role, uh, especially at the beginning of this year, and that's the discount factor. Uh, namely, if people have a lower discount factor, they tend to have higher valuations for the stocks, and therefore that's the element that's mostly affected by monetary policy or expectations about the discount factor. Thank you. Thanks.